Yesterday, we, we talked about um, the equation, which is uh, during, what was the region of operation, non-saturation? Let me just show the notes from yesterday so that it's easy. Okay, we talked about this, right? So this was the, the equation that we derived. And this equation is, how did we derive that equation? We, we took a slice of the charge under the channel and we integrated the amount of charge and we calculated the current. And what we found is that current IDS is proportional to mu n W by L C ox. And this all makes sense, right? If mu n mobility increases, you should have more current. If width increases, you should have more current. If the length decreases, you should have more current. And if the capacitance increases, you know, you will have more influence on the channel. So the current should increase. Also, if VGS increases, then there should be more current, all making sense, like zeroth order. And if the VTH drops, then you should have more current. Uh, VDS increases, to certain extent, the current will increase, okay? And what we said is, if we plot this particular characteristics uh, that we're showing, it looks like this. Uh, it looks like a parabola, and the center of the parabola is VGS minus VTH. Okay, that's what we talked about. So if you have different VGS values, what we are plotting here on this is IDS versus VDS, okay? And what you would see is uh, for different VGS values, VGS values increasing, the slow, the parabola, uh, you know, moves uh, such that the current has increased. And intentionally, I have, I have shown these as dotted lines, okay? Because today, that's what we are going to talk about, what really happens there, okay? So um, another aspect here is we want to figure out what is really going on in this region over here, okay? So let's start with the equation again, which is IDS is equal to mu n C ox W by L and then uh, VGS minus VTH, uh, VDS minus VDS square divided by 2, all right. And we can calculate del IDS divided by del VDS. What does that mean? So I have the device and I'm applying a fixed VGS and then I'm calculating this VDS. So I'm changing VDS a little bit and I'm measuring how much is the current change, okay? And what does that tell us generally? When you change the voltage and you measure the current into any circuit, what do you, what are you measuring? You are measuring conductance or a resistance, right? So in this particular case, let's say, uh, what is this value, del IDS? We can calculate quickly, what would that be? Mu n C ox W by L and then you will have VGS minus VTH and here you will have minus VDS, all right? Is that correct? We can say that around this region, you know, around close to origin, when VDS is close to zero. Generally, this number is, you, you, you design for certain value, and we are saying that when VDS approaches zero, what is the value of this expression? So, this value would be R on is equal to del IDS divided by del VDS, okay, and reciprocal, and that would look like 1 divided by mu n C ox W by L VGS minus VTH, okay? That's what we would get. And this is when VDS is close to zero. We are looking at the origin. All right. What is this telling us? This is telling us that the resistance value, hmm, it looks like a resistance first of all. And the resistance value is um, inversely proportional to VGS minus VTH. So if I increase VGS minus VTH, the resistance will drop. Makes sense, right? Because the, ch you, the channel becomes more conducting as you increase VGS minus VTH. And as a result of this relationship, it's called linear region. This mode, linear region or triode region. Okay, so this particular part of the curve, okay, this is called linear region or triode region. 
So we only derived one area where the MOSFET is operating right now. All right, and you can also uh, show this as something like this. This is your drain and source, and you are applying VGS. So if VGS increases, my resistance will drop. That's what it's telling us. All right. Now let's go into any questions on this resistive mode of operation. Okay. Huh. I'm going to come to that. Just, I mean, that's kind of your your question is a segue into the into the next thing I'm going to talk about. Okay. Let's look at the profile of the carriers. And again, you should be able to, you know, draw the cross section over and over, you know, practice that because that will make your life very easy. So this is our um, N plus, N plus, and this is uh, drain and source, and this is the gate, and this is ground, and I am applying a VGS plus minus like this and the VDS is over here plus minus VDS okay so we said that there is a channel in the you know when when VGS is above VT okay now let's look at the channel charge the equation for the channel charge okay what is the equation for the channel charge QD we, we talked about as a function of X QD X is given by W C ox VGS minus VX minus VTH. Okay. And what is this VX? That's the VX is the potential at any point in the channel. Now, when um, when we are here, this is zero, let's say, and X is moving in this direction, and then we reach. This is where we reach L channel length L, right? Length of the channel. So, at um, what is the potential V zero? x equal to 0 would be the source potential which would be 0 agree and what would be the potential at L VDS is that part clear okay so at L your QD of L is going to be equal to W C ox I'm just going to rewrite this little bit VGS minus VTH minus V of L okay which is equal to W C ox V G S minus V T H minus V D S. Okay. So what happens when V D S is equal to V G S minus V T H? That's the question. Can anybody think about this? What will happen at VDS equal to VGS minus VT? What is the equation telling us at least? It should go to 0, right? Obviously. So there is no trick question. QDL will become equal to 0 if VDS is equal to VGS minus VT. All right. So if you look at the profile of the charge, which I'll use a different color here, it will look like this. Something like this. Something like this. Okay. So there is this, you know, reservoir of charges which tapers down and becomes zero at the drain. When only under what condition? When VDS is equal to VGS minus VTH. All right. And we call this as a pinch off point. Visually, you can imagine the channel is pinched off, right? It's like you, you squish something and uh, that's it. All right. So this, uh, this is called a uh, pinch off point. Point. All right. Now, what happens if I keep increasing the VDS? That's the next question, right? Any guesses? Huh? No, I'm just saying that, okay, we understand that v, uh, VDS equal to VGS minus VTH, the, the, this will get pinched off, right? But then what will happen after that? Can you imagine what will happen? channel length will start decreasing slightly and you will have this depletion region around the, the drain. That's what exactly happens. So um, if this is shown this way, let me kind of draw it on top so it makes, uh, 
Mercedes, more sense. So when you apply uh, your uh, voltage, which is higher, then this is the way it will look like. Okay. The yellow part is showing you what happens when the VDS is greater than VGS minus VT. I mean, visually it makes sense, right? Yes. And then this region, the yellow part that I'm showing you, okay, you will have a depletion region over there. Now, what does this remind you of in the bipolar? Do you remember that the base width is extremely thin, right? And the, the, the minority carriers in the base, they get to the boundary of the depletion region and what happens then? They get swept away to the collector, correct? Same thing happens over here. So these carriers, the yellow carriers which are coming this way, they will come to this depletion region and they will get swept to the drain and the current will con continue to conduct. Because I, I want you to have that visualization so that uh, it shouldn't feel like, oh, the carriers cannot go any further and there is no current. That's not the case. It's just that there is a de depletion region and the depletion region basically gives you an electric field, a strong electric field in that region where the, uh, the mobile electrons are just sucked out to the other side. All right. So this particular region, you know, we can, um, we can say that the new channel length is called L dash now. Some different number, right? Because it will be smaller uh, because it's, it's getting pulled in. Now let's derive the equation for this region. So basically what happens is uh, beyond pinch off point, VDS will be greater than VGS minus VTH. beyond pinch up. Okay. So we can write the equation. It's exact same equation. We go from x equal to 0 to x equal to L prime for now. And this is IDS, x, dx. This is the same previous equation. And what was the integrand there? Mu n, w, c ox, hmm? vgs minus vth minus vx dx sorry dv however the voltage will go vx equal to 0 to what will be the upper limit of the voltage huh? yeah it's exactly equal to vgs minus vth okay because that's what happens when you go from um, this point to this point, VGS minus VTH, all right? So we can integrate this equation and you can, um, you can see what happens. This is going to be mu n, C ox, W, and here you will have IDS. And on the below W, what will come? L prime, okay? Because this is going to L prime, so this will be L prime. All right, and then you should have uh, VGS minus VTH times uh, VX minus VX square by 2, correct? And this will go from 0 to VGS minus VTH. I'm just integrating. And if you substitute, you will see that this will look like mu n C ox W divided by L prime. And in the bracket, what will you have? We'll have VGS minus VTH. Square divided by 2. Is that clear? If you do the integration. So generally, we don't write it this way. We just write it this way. One half. Like this. And here again, the L prime is the location uh, where pinch off happens. And in general, L prime is approximately equal to L. We say that. Because just like in the base region, we say the width of the base region, you know, changes only slightly. Similarly here, the channel length is pretty large, 
and this L prime uh, L dash or uh, delta L part, the variation is very small. So for all practical equations, we just say L prime is equal to L. All right. So this particular equation is. Do you see any dependence on VDS here? Okay. There is no dependence. So we say that pretty much if you if you are given a fixed VGS, then the current is constant of this device. So it looks like a current source, pretty much. Okay. The current doesn't change. And um, you also say that the current is saturated. It doesn't change anymore. And that's the reason we call the device is in the saturation region. Okay. So this is the saturation region. Region of operation. Okay. So I'm going to summarize everything. We did two regions of operation. So I'm going to summarize all that just in a minute. Uh, so if we start plotting the curve, it's going to look like this. Okay. We are plotting VDS and we are plotting IDS. Okay. All right. And if you remember the, the previous uh, uh, curve, right, we said this looks like a parabola. Okay, let me redo it again. Okay, that's better. Okay. And after that, it becomes constant. Do you remember that, uh, that picture I showed you? Earlier we said that, oh, it's going to look like a parabola like this. And what was this value? This was going to be? VGS1 minus VTH and this would be for value VGS1, okay. So I'm plotting the characteristics of the transistor IDS versus VDS by changing the VGS at every step of the way, okay. For one VGS1 value, I will, I found out that this, use a different color. Okay, beyond this point, the transistor is saturated. Okay, and the value of the current is fixed, which is mu n c ox w by l vgs minus vt square, vgs one minus vt square. Let's plot other curve, which will look like this. If I increase vgs, then you will see something that will look like this, and that would be our. VGS2. And what would be this point? What would be the value of VG, VDS for it to go into saturation? VGS2 minus VTH. VGS2 minus VTH. And we can do another one like this, something like this, that will look like this, and it will continue. And this value, where it would, this would look like? VGS 3 minus VTH and this is VGS 3, okay. So you can say that you can draw this line here that looks like this and this region is called triode linear, okay, or non-sat region, okay. And the other side is called saturation region, region of operation. Is this part clear? How the transistor characteristics looks like? And this is all based on device physics. Although I didn't go through, you know, all the, each and every equation, but I think you follow the insights, right? Huh? Please. Why do we? Okay, let's reverse, uh, go back uh, 30, uh, maybe 10 minutes ago. If you remember, I showed you resistance value. What does that resistance value look like? It looks, it's inversely proportional to VGS minus VT and it's fixed. That's the reason we call it linear. Okay. So pretty much when VDS is small, it almost looks like a linear resistor. That's why we call it linear. Okay. All right. So let me uh, kind of summarize. Uh, what does this characteristics look like, by the way? Does it remind you of something we just learned a few lectures ago? 
the bipolar characteristics, right? So in the bipolar characteristics, what did we have? Let's draw the bipolar characteristics also similarly, just so that you kind of get, it looks like this. Something like this. And what was this value right here? VCE saturation, if you remember, right? This was like 0.2 to 0.3 volts. And beyond that, this is our, what are we plotting here? This is VCE and we are plotting IC, okay? And we are plotting it for different, different VBE, 1, VBE 2, VBE 3, that's what we are doing, right? So in the, in the MOS case, it's a very gradual process. In the bipolar case, as soon as your VCE is greater than 0.3 volts, bam, you got straight line, okay? So that, I think that's the visualization you, I want you to have constantly between bipolar and MOS, bipolar and MOS, how they behave, all right? Okay, and again, in the bipolar case, how is the transistor action happening? Which direction? It's vertical, right? You're going in the substrate. There is uh, diffusion layers after diffusion layers. In the MOS case, it's happening laterally. Okay, you have source and drain and there is action going on horizontally. I think these are the key things that I want you to remember when we finish this entire course, right? I mean, these are important things that you need to take with you, no matter what. Okay. Uh, so people get really confused when it comes to bipolar and MOS. You know, people, uh, what I see traditionally, um, since I've been in this field so long, right? Everybody says, oh, I remember everything about MOSFETs, but I don't know anything about bipolars. As soon as you give a bipolar circuit, they get wrecked. Uh, they have to go back to books, right? So I don't want that to happen to you. So that's the reason we are kind of focusing this course in such a way that you, you go through, you should be able to go back and forth between both the devices. Uh, you know, really uh, seamlessly and be able to understand uh, positives and negatives of both, okay? So one key chart I would like you to remember, okay? Uh, so pay attention. Uh, it's a summary of uh, bipolar and, uh, and MOSFETs, okay? So let's do uh, bipolar in yellow and MOS in magenta, okay? So whenever VCE is less than 0.3 volts, what do we call, call that? Bipolar is in huh? saturation. All right. And then when VCE is greater than 0.3 volts, huh? forward active region, keep it short, active mode. Okay, this is active mode. So in this region, uh, the device will act as a switch. SW is a switch, right? When VC is less than 0.3. If you remember, uh, many of you asked me questions later on, this saturation, where are you going to really use it? It's like turning on the device and bringing down the voltage to 0.2 volts, right? Um, completely. And it looks like a switch. Otherwise, it looks, so there is, either the device is off, when bipolar is off, what happens? The output goes high, if you remember that uh, particular. And if it's in the middle, then it's an amplifier. And when it's saturated, it looks like a zero. So it's like an inversion that's happening from input to output, okay? In the active mode, the device is use useful for, acts as an amplifier, okay? So similarly, in the MOS case, when VDS is less than, VGS minus VTH, okay? Then we call the devices in linear mode, triode mode, or non-saturation, okay? And when VDS is greater than VGS minus VTH, what do we call? The device is in saturation. So this is something that you need to have it clear in your head. And what is the biggest confusion in this process? Where the device is called in saturation, okay? In the bipolar case, the definition is exactly flipped. And in the MOS case, it is the active mode, the, what we want it to be, is what is called saturation. 
So if you understand this clearly and if this is clear in your head, you're kind of there 50% of the way. Because this is where the majority of the confusion happens. And don't ask me why it is that way. That's the way it is. Okay. That we cannot debate that out right now in this class. It's traditional, let me put it this way. I mean, if you read the books, they'll say, this confusion is there, but nobody wants to fix it. People are used to it, right? So uh, the definition of saturation is, is flipped in the, in the two cases, um, in the MOSFET case versus in the bipolar case. Is this clear? Okay, you'll remember this. The next effect uh, that we're gonna talk about is, what was the next thing we did in the bipolar case? I mean, you remember the movie, right? I hope. What was the next thing we did? Awesome. What is your name? Ipsit just said that it's early voltage. So let's figure out if there is an early voltage for the MOSFET also. And just as he brought it to my attention, there is something called, okay. So let's draw the device again, like this. And when the device is in saturation, this is the way the carriers are, right? And this is our source, N plus, drain, N plus, and this is P minus. And this is our uh, gate potential. So what, if you remember, VDS equal to VGS minus VTH. What is the value, I mean, this particular point will approach the drain completely, right? And as I keep increasing the VDS, okay, so let me draw something here. This was our channel length L and this is our new channel length which is L prime, okay? As VDS increases, what will happen to L prime? Huh? L prime will decrease. Does this make sense? Right? L prime was equal to L when VDS was equal to VGS minus VT. Correct? And as we start increasing VDS even further, huh, the, the, the channel length will start shrinking. The, the depletion layer width will start slightly increasing. And what does that look like in bipolars? You remember? Base width modulation. You remember that, right? So in, in the bipolar case, if, if you start increasing VCE, then there will be a depletion layer which width will start increasing and the base width will start reducing. Similarly here, the L prime will start reducing, okay, compared to the actual L. So both phenomenon look kind of similar. And this particular phenomenon in, in MOSFETs is called channel length modulation. Okay, makes sense, right? If I keep playing with my VDS, then the channel length will keep moving around. So it's called channel length modulation effect. All right, so let's analyze the channel length modulation. Okay, let's call this delta L here. Okay, so you can say that L equal to L prime plus delta L. So delta L increases as you keep increasing VDS. All right. So delta L divided by L is kind of a percentage variation in the, um, in the delta L. Okay. And that is given by lambda times VDS. Okay. So if VDS increases, delta L will increase. This relationship, it's an empirical relationship for any process. Okay, and this is happening in saturation region. Okay, and this is the uh, channel length modulation coefficient. Okay, so we can substitute here. We can say that what is L prime divided by L? What is that equal to? L minus delta L divided by L. What is that equal to? 1 minus lambda VDS. Does that make sense? I'm just substituting here. Okay. So I can also say that L divided by L prime is equal to 1 plus 
lambda vds assuming this part is very small okay approximation so then you can say that 1 divided by l prime is equal to 1 plus lambda vds divided by l now you can see where i am going with it is this part clear so far how i got to this equation fairly straightforward so what we can do in our original saturation equation what was the original saturation equation is uh, ids is equal to half mu n c ox w divided by in the saturation mode l prime right so this was l prime and this is vgs minus vth square this is the equation we derived and that will now become half mu n c ox w divided by i can substitute this particular part which would be l and then i'll also get vgs minus vth square 1 plus lambda vds is this making sense all right so this kind of models if vds increases okay then the ids will slightly increase okay this lambda is assumed to be a small number depending on the process technology okay and other key idea is delta l divided by l is equal to lambda vds this is something you need to remember okay so if i increase l what will happen if you increase l then the lambda will also go down okay so higher the channel length the lambda value depends on the length of the of the channel okay so think about it this way it's a it's a relative variation like uh, delta l and the channel length l if you keep increasing the l then the delta l which is happening kind of remains about the same so relative variation is lot less okay so in effect then the lambda value changes okay so if you keep increasing the l then the device becomes more and more ideal okay there is no dependence on uh, on your uh, vds okay so let's say you're designing a current source what would you like what what is the property that you desire in a current source no matter what voltage i apply the currents should be fixed right that's a current source so had you chosen a smaller length then changing the vds would change the ids you know somewhat few percent as i keep increasing the channel length it would resemble you know better and better transistor all right so um, again longer l smaller lambda and this is the property that you would use as you start designing the circuits okay so uh, the purpose of this class uh, this this particular overall class is not to teach you how to do design you know subliminally you will learn the techniques but it's more to analyze but when you start analyzing somebody else's circuits you will realize why did you choose certain channel length here compared to over here okay so that's the insight part you need to remember so whenever you need a device to operate as a current source what would be naturally you would be doing you would increase keep a larger channel length okay as as much as possible okay so let's plot the curve now okay we said that it was going to look like this earlier correct now instead of that what you will see is you will see some kind of slope here something like this and okay now i can't really i i should have drawn it a little bit differently but i think you can imagine if i go this way all of them will meet to the same location okay okay let me do it again maybe here it will be clearer
something like this and if you if you draw this then you will see that this would be the early voltage which is equal to minus 1 over lambda that is your early voltage minus Va is equal to minus 1 over lambda and this is very similar to if you remember the bipolar case what was the thing we had 1 plus Vce divided by Va and in MOS case what do we have 1 plus Vds divided by 1 divided by lambda okay. Now this 1 divided by lambda is our Va very similar in both cases okay got it okay. The next effect so this lambda is again a process dependent parameter okay. So if you if you choose a technology from TSMC at certain node you will have some value if you choose it from uh, UMC it will have a different value if you use from SCL it will have a different value. So when you start designing as a designer you need to know all these numbers okay you need to know uh, different different coefficients for your device. So using those coefficients you can do quick hand analysis okay when you are designing the circuits. So lambda is one of the important factors because it decides your output impedance or output resistance which we are going to talk about shortly okay all right. The next effect we are going to talk about is uh, which does not happen in a bipolar transistor but it is very unique to MOSFETs it is called body effect. Okay. So again let us draw the picture. This is P sub N plus N plus P plus and this is our substrate sorry this is our uh, gate. Source and this is drain and this is your gate and this is the body bulk connection or a body connection okay. So if you if you look at this device right in a way what it looks like is two capacitors okay. This is the gate and this is my channel correct and this part is your bulk the back side. Can you visualize that? I am intentionally showing it this way simplifying it. Now to get the channel to be present okay for a given body voltage we have certain VTH value that you need right if you remember the threshold voltage definition. Now if I keep reducing this bulk voltage what will happen? Do you think I need higher voltage or lower voltage at the gate? Let me rephrase the question. Originally the bulk was connected to ground okay and gate you know is at VTH so that you form the channel under the under the device under the gate. Now if I take the body voltage the bulk voltage lower intuitively what do you think we need to do? Huh? Do I need to increase the voltage? Increase or decrease? No, no I am saying what should be the gate voltage to keep the channel existing? You have to increase right it looks like a capacitive divider. So if I pull one voltage down the other needs to pull it back up conceptually. So that is exactly what the body effect is okay. So if the bulk voltage is gets lower, lower, lower then the gate voltage needs to be higher, higher, higher to get the channel exist. So um, in effect you are modulating the threshold voltage of the device is that clear? The effective threshold voltage is changing. So if the bulk voltage gets negative compared to source voltage then the threshold voltage increases. Intuitively does it make sense? That is kind of what I am getting to. So if you let me draw the picture one more time. So by the way this is the way you draw the MOSFET. I do not know if I showed you already. This is a symbol. This is the drain region okay and this is the source region and this is our gate alright. And the, the back gate or the bulk is shown like this okay just like what you would see at this point right this is the what it is shown over here. So this is like a sleeping transistor it looks like this 
correct and this would be my source. So, you kind of fold it horizontally and take a look at it. So, this is the way you draw the NMOS device. All right. Now, let us apply voltages. So, we are applying VDS which is looks like uh, or we can call it just VD and then you can apply V bulk and you can apply V source and we are applying VG, okay. So, what did we say? If VB becomes more negative compared to VS, okay, then the VTH will increase, increase, right? VT will increase. So, what we are saying is if VSB increases VTH effective, okay, should increase. Note the, note the point here. If bulk is going negative, then VSB is becoming positive. Okay. This is just for definition, so you can visualize the whole thing. All right. Typically, Vs is equal to 0 and then uh, the V bulk has to go negative compared to that. All right. So, um, when we write the equation, the equation looks like this. Vth is equal to Vth 0 plus gamma square root of 2 phi f plus Okay, and the body effect coefficient is gamma is given by square root of 2 q epsilon s i n sub divided by c ox. Okay, so again this is a technology dependent parameter. And the value generally lies uh, something like 0.3 to 0.4 square root of volts, since there is square root term over here. Okay. Is this part clear? So, you could also counter argue by looking at this, saying that, hey, what if I make, take the bulk voltage positive, then what will happen? So, in this particular equation, I am going to make this voltage negative, right? If this Vsb is negative, then what would happen to this particular term? Hmm? It will become, it will become negative, right? Because this particular term will be smaller than uh, this 2 phi f term. Is this part clear? Okay. What I am saying is, if I make Vsb negative or if I make, take the bulk even higher than the source, then we can make this term negative, I mean um, smaller than 2 phi f and actually that is what happens. You can reduce the Vt also, okay. Um, however, there is a caution. So, what we are saying is that if I keep, um, if, I, if I make this bulk positive compared to source, what is the danger? There is a forward bias over here if you can see okay between uh, between these two source and bulk and it may be okay i have used used the, the transistor in this fashion all you have to make sure is that that forward bias doesn't cause a lot of current to flow so you, as long as you limit the current flowing then you can take advantage of the fact and how do you limit the current you will put some kind of resistance in the path so that the current doesn't shoot up beyond high value. You can keep the current in microamps and things will be okay. Okay? All right. But we'll get to that a little bit later. But I just wanted to conceptually tell you what's really going on here. The last thing we're going to talk about today is something called subthreshold region. Okay. To motivate you on subthreshold region, does anybody here in this class have a Swiss watch? Please raise your hand. Seriously? Not a single person? You know where Switzerland is, right? 
Okay. So Switzerland, um, you know, there are a lot of uh, IC designers, circuit designers, and I know a few of them very well. So they really got into this area of subthreshold region. Because if you have a if you have a watch, um, I don't have a Swiss watch, uh, but um, the the point of the Swiss watch was one thing was extremely accurate, and the other thing was they would last a long time. So if you want to last a long time, what do you want to do? You want to reduce the current consumption quite a lot. Okay, so uh, they were the ones who came up with circuit designs for Swiss Swiss, uh, Swiss watches. Okay, so in the Swiss watches, they operate in this particular region. That's why I'm trying to tell you the story, uh, so that you'll remember that this is one of the important regions of operation. Okay, so subthreshold region of operation is what is used in many of the watches, um, and what's the obvious reason to reduce the amount of current, okay, that you're taking from the battery, so that the watches will last a long, long time. Okay, so where is this subthreshold region? So let's plot VGS versus, note down, this is square root of IDS. Again, this is an interview question. So I want, whatever I have taught you so far, you should be able to answer this question. How would this look like? What is x-axis? VGS. And what's the y-axis? Square root of IDS. And you can assume that the transistor is in saturation mode. What would it look like? Archishman? Going through zero origin, then? VTH, very good. So what Archishman said is that this would be my VTH, okay? And then after that, I should see a straight line. So this is the way we expect it to look like, right? So this is what we expect. And what we are saying is that above VTH, the transistor is in saturation and below VTH, zero, nothing going on, okay? In reality, this is, this doesn't happen. In reality, what you will see is the following. I have exaggerated a little bit, but there is a, there is a soft knee. Nothing in the world is discontinuous. If you remember the very first, right? There is no such thing as current is turned off and current is turned on. Okay, it's all, there is a smooth process. So that's what happens in reality. And this particular region is called sub-threshold region. Okay, so if you're a classical analog designer, you kind of want to stay away from this region because you want to always keep your device in saturation. Why? Because you know the equations, you know, um, mu n c ox w by l divided by 2 vgs minus vt square right but when you come to subthreshold region this equations change a little bit and so the equation in the subthreshold region uh, what this is saying is that if vgs is um, less than vth okay uh, then there is a finite ids is flowing and the ids value is given by i0 exponential of vgs divided by vt now in this case, this VT is again back to KT over Q. So it kind of looks like a bipolar transistor in that small region of operation, okay? And uh, so the amount of current is extremely small and you can still make it work like an amplifier as long as you take advantage of the situation and you know the model very well. But classical analog designers, they want to stay out of this region because you don't know, you don't know how to do the hand calculations quickly. So um, the analog guys, try to keep away from this region by about 100 to 200 millivolts, okay? We don't want to be close to that region. So we always want to keep our VGS higher than VT by 100 to 200 millivolts to stay out of this region. And, okay, that's the key point. And this is the way the transistor behaves and here it behaves like a, more like a bipolar transistor. So we'll stop right here because you have the next class. Thank you everyone.